Starting right off the bat, Marianne Warren on the legal and moral status of abortion. She begins by critiquing Thompson's defense of abortion. She tried to argue that abortion is permissible even if a fetus is a person. Warren isn't having any of that. So she says the Thompson analogy cannot help us produce a clear and persuasive proof of the moral permissibility of abortion, nor will opponents of the restrictive laws thank us for anything less. Here she's talking specifically about the violinist case. You can go back to the reading. She says, the violinist case is going to show that abortion is okay when pregnancy results from an involuntary act. That's it. That's all the violinist case can do. Furthermore, she makes the claim that if a fetus is indeed a person, which is what Thompson is assuming, then the right to abortion goes out the window. Warren thinks that abortion is permissible. So she's going to be in this second major camp that we talked about in the last couple of videos. Namely, she thinks abortion is permissible because fetuses are not persons. So she's going to spend her essay arguing that fetuses are not persons. One of the other major problems that Warren has with Thompson's argument is that it doesn't permit abortion in enough cases. So Warren thinks that abortion is way more permissible than what Thompson thought. Thompson was really only defending the idea that abortion is okay in some cases. She wasn't saying it's okay in every case for every reason. Warren kind of takes that view. She kind of takes the view that abortion is permissible in pretty much every case whatsoever, for whatever reason. Here's what she has to say about opponents of abortion restrictions, and she counts herself as one. Here's what she says. Their conviction, for the most part, is that abortion is obviously not a morally serious and extremely unfortunate, even though sometimes justified act, comparable to killing in self-defense or letting the violinist die, but rather is closer to being a morally neutral act, like cutting one's hair. So Warren, I think, locates herself in this camp, the idea being that there's really nothing morally wrong or bad about abortion, really at all. It's akin to getting your hair cut. So again, Thompson's analogy in the violinist case, it only succeeds at showing that abortion is permissible in involuntary cases. This is what Warren is saying. But Warren wants something much more than that. She wants to show that abortion is okay pretty much any time for any reason. The central reason that Warren gives, so why think that abortion is morally permissible for any reason at any time? The central reason that Warren gives is that fetuses are not persons. Regarding this, Warren seems to align with the Supreme Court. Remember, go back to Roe v. Wade. Roe v. Wade had said, if personhood is established, then of course Roe's case collapses for the fetus's right to life would guarantee, be guaranteed specifically by the 14th Amendment. The idea there is, if a fetus is a person, you can't abort it. So Warren agrees. She says, yeah, if it's a person, we can't allow abortion, but it's not a person. In the service of trying to show that a fetus is not a person, Warren draws a distinction between person in two different types of sense. So on one hand, we have human beings, members of the species Homo sapien. On the other hand, we have members of the moral community, so the set of all beings with full and equal moral rights. Simply by being human, that's not enough to count as a person. So different individuals that are different things, really, that might count as human but not persons, uh, fetuses, skin cells, that, those are going to be genetically human, not persons, and maybe people in persistent vegetative states, uh, people who are brain dead, they might count as human beings, it's a living human body, but it's not a person. Similarly, she thinks that being a person doesn't imply that you're human either. So she thinks that there might be persons that are not human at all. So she leaves open the possibility that artificial intelligence could be a person, could become a person someday. She leaves open the possibility that there are extraterrestrials that count as persons, so rational beings, even if they're not human. So artificial intelligence, that's not human. Extraterrestrial, that's not human. Those aren't members of the species. So for Warren, being a member of the species Homo sapien doesn't make you a person. Being human, genetically human, is neither necessary nor sufficient to be a person. Some persons are non-human, and some humans are non-persons. 
So we get a picture where there's an overlap. Uh, obviously, there are going to be lots of human beings that are also persons, but there are going to be a lot of things that fall outside of that overlap as well. There are alternatives here. On alternative views, you might think that all human beings are persons and all persons are human beings. On this view, it would say every single person is a human being. There's no such thing as a person that's not human, but there's also no such thing as a human being that's not a person. The two categories are just completely overlapping. More commonly, though, will be people who say that human beings are one subset of persons. So yeah, there might be other persons out there, extraterrestrials, whatever, but every human being, every individual human organism counts as a person just in virtue of being a human being. For the time being though, human being, genetically human, and person are two separate categories. For Warren, there are five traits that are associated with personhood. The idea here is that if we were to encounter some sort of being that we wanted to decide or determine, is this a person or not? Here are some criteria that we could look at to help us make a decision or a judgment about whether or not something is a person. So the five traits that are central to the concept of personhood, according to Warren, are this. Consciousness of objects or events external and internal to the being, uh, and a kind of awareness of what's going on outside or awareness of what's going on in your own mind. Um, and the capacity to feel pain in particular. Reasoning, the developed capacity to solve new and relatively complex problems. Third is self-motivated activity, uh, which is activity which is relatively independent of either genetic or direct external control. So whatever actions you're performing that are self-motivated, they're not determined specifically or strictly by your physiology. It's you have some sort of power or control over the things you're doing, the way you're moving. Fourth, the capacity to communicate by whatever means messages of an indefinite variety of types, that is not just an indefinite number of possible contents, but on an indefinitely many topics. And this is talking about the ability to talk, speak, write, and, and the ability to talk about lots of different things or communicate about lots of different things. And fifth, the presence of self-concepts uh, or self-awareness of the individual. So here, one way of testing this that we sometimes rely on, or we can, is the mirror test, where you take an animal, you mark it somewhere on its face, uh, and then show it a mirror. If it responds to the mirror by touching its own face wherever the mark is, then it has a concept of self. It recognizes by looking at the mirror, this isn't another animal, this is me. Uh, and then the idea is this is just one way in which we can test to see does the individual thing have self-awareness. Infants, I think, take something like 15 to 18 months before human children develop a self-awareness self of this kind. So they fail the mirror test up until that point, up until 15 to 18 months. They don't have a concept of self. For Warren, it's important to note that you don't have to have all five to count as a person. So remember, person is a member of the moral community, you have rights, you have moral status, whereas human being, that's just you're a member of the species. So for Warren, it's not that you have to have all five. Uh, here's what she says. We needn't suppose that an entity have all five or all of these attributes to be properly considered a person. One and two alone may well be sufficient for personhood. So if you have consciousness and reasoning, that might be enough. But quite probably one through three are enough to count as a person if activity is construed to include a kind of activity of reasoning, the ability to think through problems, solve problems, that sort of thing. In any case, whether you need one and two or you need one, two, and three to count as a person, it's crucial to note that she thinks if you lack all five of these, there's no way you can count as a person. So any being that lacks all five is just clearly not a person. And for her, according to Warren, a fetus lacks all five. So a fetus doesn't have consciousness, reasoning, self-motivated activity, capacity to communicate, or the presence of self-concepts at any stage in development. So we're talking seven, eight, nine months into pregnancy. Fetus doesn't have any of these five. So it can't count as a person. 
If it doesn't count as a person, then it doesn't have rights. So if it doesn't have rights, then it obviously doesn't have a right to life. That means killing them can't be thought of as immoral uh, in the sense of it can't be thought of as violating an individual's rights, at least. You're not killing a person. You're killing maybe a potential person, but not a person. So this gets Warren the result that she's looking for. Remember, she thinks abortion really doesn't have any sort of moral weight. It's not bad or wrong in any real way. It's morally neutral. Potential problems for Warren. First off, you might wonder why I think these five criteria are good criteria for personhood. If someone were to deny the appropriateness of these five criteria, I do not know what further arguments would convince them. We would probably have to admit that our conceptual schemes were indeed irreconcilably different. So again, that's not really an argument so much as she's appealing to some kind of intuition. She sees personhood as associated with these five things, but if you think of personhood as something different, then you're just talking about different things, different concepts. Warren actually goes on further, and she also says, I don't expect this to happen. Uh, so she doesn't expect that people are going to disagree with her about her account of personhood, uh, specifically because, she says, I think the concept of a person is one in which is nearly universal to people, and that it's common to both pro-abortionists and anti-abortionists. In other words, she thinks, yeah, if people disagreed with this account of personhood, we'd probably be talking about radically different things. We're not even talking about the same subject. But pretty much everyone agrees with me, is what Warren is saying. Everyone kind of agrees that this is what a person is or what a person has to have. So that gives you a sense of a problem that might arise for her account of personhood. Specifically, she doesn't give an argument for it, right? She just says, if you don't agree with me, we must not be talking about the same thing. She also makes a point of saying, if you think that a being could lack these five things and still be a person, you probably don't know what you're talking about. You're not using the concept person in any sort of appropriate way. We might ask, though, for an argument here, see if we can develop some sort of argument for these five. Why are these five traits important? Now that aside, we can look at the individual criteria uh, themselves. So let's just look at the first one. Consciousness. So the being has to be conscious in order to count as a person. Pretty clearly she can't mean actual consciousness. If that were the case, then you would lose it anytime you go to sleep. And it would be a big problem if you lost personhood and therefore all of your rights every time you fell asleep. It's potential consciousness. Like, somebody who's asleep has the potential to be conscious, they can wake up. If that's the case, well, fetuses do have a kind of potential consciousness. In normally developing fetuses, they do have that potential. They will become conscious at some point. They just have to continue developing. Just like the sleeping person only requires time. So they're unconscious, or they're non-conscious, but they require time to become conscious in both cases. So here, there are problems of Either Warren's going to exclude too much by saying that sleeping individuals are not persons, or she's going to end up including fetuses as persons, since they are potentially conscious. Looking at criterion two, so this is reasoning, capability to solve complex problems. The biggest problem here is that infants don't have that capacity. So if you require capability to feel pain, Maybe infants satisfy that, according to Warren. But you also require capacity to reason, solve complex problems. Then, according to Warren's account, infants are not persons. That means they don't have rights. So killing an infant would be morally equivalent to killing a fetus. So if you think that killing a fetus is okay, uh, namely you think abortion is okay, then killing an infant seems just as justifiable. Most people will argue that infanticide is wrong, however, so that suggests there's something wrong with Warren's argument. It's worth noting it's not just infants, but maybe toddlers lack this type of reasoning ability. Certain adults, you know, with particular mental disabilities might not have the capacity to reason to the level that Warren is talking about, and 
what ends up happening is if you accept her account of personhood, none of these individuals count as persons, so they don't have rights. Kayser puts it like this, in seeking to exclude the preborn from personhood, people with disabilities are stripped of their basic rights and fundamental protections. Anyone who has a kind of mental disability that results in not being able to reason at this level loses all their rights. That'll strike many people as an unacceptable result of Warren's reasoning. Warren is, is aware of this, so in the postscript to what you read for today's video, she says, according to my argument, neither abortion nor killing of neonates is properly considered a form of murder. In other words, she accepts that conclusion. So what she's saying is, yeah, infanticide or abortion, they're not morally distinct in the sense that neither involves the killing of a person. So she accepts that consequence. She tries to argue that there are still reasons to not commit infanticide, uh, namely, there might be families willing to adopt an infant, and so it's wrong to kill infants because there's families out there that would want to adopt them. Uh, it's hard to see how that doesn't apply to the unborn as well. Um, but she goes on. We can continue to discuss that uh, on Canvas. We can talk more about criteria number three through five as well. Five in particular, uh, this concept of self, that's something that I noted earlier. It doesn't develop until 15 to 18 months. So again, infants and toddlers won't count as persons in that they don't have a concept of self on this view. Now, as we wrap this up, Warren's account of personhood represents what might be called the performance view of personhood. So the performance view of personhood holds that a being is to be accorded respect if and only if the being functions in a given way. So you have to have certain features, you have to be able to do certain things to count as a person. And remember, being a person means having rights. So you have to have a certain kind of function to count as a person. This, Christopher Kayser says, is an exclusive view. So not all human beings deserve respect and share fundamental dignity, but only those human beings possessing particular characteristics. This stands in contrast to the endowment view. So if we put our charts up, the performance view says that not all human beings count as persons. To count as a person, you have to be a special kind of human being. You have to function in a certain way. The endowment view, on the other hand, says that all human beings do count as persons. So every living human organism counts as a person. It has rights. Human beings, all of them get included as persons, but there might be other species that count as persons as well. To be a human individual means to have rights on this other view. So that's the endowment view. The endowment view says each human being has inherent moral worth simply in virtue of the type of being it is. So the endowment view is an inclusive view in that just by being human, you get included in the group of persons. Endowment view includes all human beings. Performance view excludes certain human beings from counting as persons and therefore having rights. Why does this matter? You might think that there are problems with the performance view. So historically, for example, when, when human beings have been divided into two groups, persons and non-persons, those with rights and those without rights, bad things have happened. So this is what Christopher Kayser has to say, and I'll close with this. History provides strong evidence in favor of an inclusive society in which all human beings are respected as persons having dignity as opposed to an exclusive society. Indeed, when considered in the light of history, it seems apparent that every single time the performance view was chosen over the endowment view, gross moral mistakes were made. Virtually no one today, at least in the West, would publicly defend any of the applications of the performance view throughout history, slavery, misogyny, racism, sexism, or anti-Semitism. So in all of those cases, you had human beings being divided into two categories, those with rights and those without. Kayser is saying, do we really have reason to believe that for the first time in human history, we're justified in treating some human beings as less than fully persons? 
or will we be judged by history as just one more episode in the long line of exploitation of the powerful over the weak? So the challenge is, if you adopt the performance view of personhood, and you say some human beings have rights and others don't, how does that stack up against ways in which the same sort of reasoning was applied throughout history? That's not to say that Warren is incorrect. That's not to say that fetuses are persons or anything like that. It's just an open challenge. So if you're going to defend the view that fetuses are not persons, you're going to have to contend with this concern that we're not just repeating the same type of mistake as we've seen throughout history when human beings have been divided into the rights holders and the non-rights holders. To sum up, we've covered those who think abortion is permissible. We've covered two schools of thought within that category. Namely, Thompson, who hold that even if a fetus is a person, abortion is still permissible, and Warren, who argue that abortion is permissible specifically because fetuses are not persons. We looked at challenges that meet both of those, and so in bringing in those challenges, we've covered the category of people who say abortion is impermissible because fetuses are persons. So that's where we're going to pick up with the next video. Until then, here are some resources that you might look into, uh, things that might be helpful if you want to continue studying these topics.